Well, uh, for those of you who haven't been with us, uh, maybe you're new or visiting, um, we've been starting a series in the book of James. And um, today we're going to continue that journey through James. And uh, I'm just going to bow in prayer quickly to ask blessing on the word. God, this is your word. Lord, I pray that you would speak through it, that you'd help me to articulate, God, what it is that your people need to hear today. And Lord, we just pray your blessing upon the remainder of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we, um, we ended on James chapter 1, 27. And in James 27, uh, 1, 27, we discussed the nature of religion and what God considered as pure and faultless religion. Now, there's lots of people who claim to be religious out there, but it doesn't necessarily translate into a difference in the way that they live. And James clarified that the religion that God considers pure and faultless is this, to be other-centered, to be full of mercy, to be keeping an eye out for others who are experiencing distress in their lives, and out of compassion, coming to their rescue when they need help. That's the paraphrase of it. In addition to this, God considers pure and faultless religion to express itself through holy living by keeping oneself from being polluted by the world's corruption around us. And this is done as an act of worship to God out of love for Him. So today, in our text, we're going to continue in the book of James. And James is going to be speaking throughout this book kind of on the same theme. You know, James is expressing in this book that if we have faith, if we believe, then that faith ought to make a real difference in how we live. And if it's not, we have to consider the legitimacy of our faith. So, in our text today, our text is James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. You can follow along with us on the overhead, or if you have your Bible on your app, or um, a Bible in hand, you can follow along with me. James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, and a message that I've entitled, Living Out the Royal Law. Now, James begins to teach the recipients of his letter on the, on the coattails of what I just explained. He begins to to teach the recipients of his letter by saying, My brothers and, and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord, Christ Jesus, must not show favoritism. My brothers and sisters, believers in our Lord, our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes to your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You know, I, I wish I could tell you that we live in a world where there's no discrimination. Wouldn't that be nice? But we don't. We all know it. We see it all around us. I wish I could tell you that no one would judge you because uh, of your skin color or your nationality or your traditions or the food that you eat. But very often, people do. I wish I could tell you that Christians would treat everyone with equal value as a person. But sadly, I cannot. We live in a world 
where favoritism and discrimination in all their various forms are very real and present. At some level, all of us sitting here today have been discriminated against, whether that was because of how we looked, how we sounded when we talked, whether we were too skinny, whether we were too fat, whether we were athletic, whether we weren't, whether we were smart, or whether we had challenges in school. See, the world of wickedness in which we live has always been filled with prejudicial behavior based on socio-economic class. Ethnicity, culture, too, and um, nationality. There's been, at the root of many of this world's significant conflicts over the centuries, there's been at the root of this uh, a pride and a prejudice where people feel as though they have to present themselves as right and as better than others. James starts off his passage and gets right to the point. He says that genuine believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ are not to show favoritism. True religion that God considers pure and undefiled does not show partiality when dealing with other people. Period. I understand we can struggle with this, but God says that in His Word. Jesus came to the earth to show us what God is like with skin on. Jesus, the Scriptures teach, is the world's creator he is God in the flesh, the living Word of God sent into the world. Jesus. Jesus. He is before all things. He is above all things. He is ruler over all things. And Jesus is not just some good teacher that came across uh, with some great teachings. No, Jesus Christ was the living God come down to us. The Father sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to show us what He's like. But more than that, He came to set us free by sacrificing Himself on the cross for sinners who needed a Savior. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, 17, it's written this about God. For, your, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who does not show partiality and accepts no bribes. Now when we Ask Jesus to become our Savior. A miraculous transformation takes place in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God enters and makes His home in those who truly place their trust in Him. And Jesus forgives all of our sins and cleans us on the inside so that we become a suitable place for God's Holy Spirit to dwell. This isn't something that we can do for ourselves. It is a gift of God that is freely given by His grace. We can't save ourselves, people. This makes a difference in the world. When, when God enters people's lives, it makes a difference in the world. And if it's not making a difference in the world with those who are claiming to know God, there is a problem. When God's Holy Spirit enters us, God's Holy Spirit gives His children a new heart to do what is right. Just as God is holy, so God calls His people to be holy in all that they do. Before we enter a saving relationship with our Creator, we may desire to do the right things, and we may be even able to force ourselves to follow a good direction 
for a period of time, but until self-interest is displaced from ruling. And God has given control of the human heart. All things eventually gravitate towards selfishness and self-gratification. It's how humanity is hardwired in the sin nature that has come upon us because of Adam. It's passed down to every one of us. At the root of all the social problems in the world, the core issue is that of sin in the human heart. And God has decreed from the very beginning. He warned Adam and Eve, don't sin or you will surely die. But they believed the lie of the devil and they disobeyed God and therefore sin came into the world. And all have sinned because of this. All be human beings are born into sin. All of us are sinners and are heading towards eternal death in the lake of fire unless we're saved somehow from this condition. And that is why as human beings, we can't save ourselves. We can't. It's not within us, in our own character, to be able to be good enough to save ourselves. We can't do it. We're sinners. The only way that we can be saved is if a Savior can come and, and save us. See, that's why God, God came to us. He came to us and, and veiled himself in human flesh. He became a man, a perfect man, perfectly God, but perfectly man without sin. He came specifically because he loved us and he did not want us to suffer the penalty of our sins. God wills that none of us should perish but that everyone should come to repentance, that everyone should come to cleanness inside of themselves so that God can live inside of their hearts. God desires this. But people push away. They push away. But they don't realize that the creator of the universe subjected himself to death on a cross because he loved us. He didn't have to. He was the creator and sustainer of all things, yet he humbled himself and became obedient to death on the cross. And he gave his life so that the wrath of God, the wrath of himself, could be poured out upon him instead of upon us. That's the nature of salvation. Isn't that a great message? God doesn't want people to die. He wants people to come to know him and become at, at, atoned at one with him. All we have to do is believe that He is God's way to eternal life. Accept Him as our Savior and place our faith in Him. When we recognize ourselves as sinners in need of a cleansing and look to Jesus our Savior, as our Savior and willingly turn away from our life of rebellion and sin, when we do that, the Holy Spirit we are washed clean. The Holy Spirit comes inside and makes His dwelling in us. He makes His home in us as believers. So we're no longer alone. We're no longer sojourning this planet without God, without hope. Because hope comes in the form of the Lord. When the Spirit of God comes inside of us, He brings us true hope. The Holy Spirit fills us with His presence and He reveals God's great love for us. He sets us free and He empowers us to change old patterns of sinful, rebellious living. Our wicked, hardened heart is displaced by a soft, righteous heart that starts to see the world and other people around us differently. We can't do this ourselves. I can't force myself to be righteous and to, and to do the right things. I can't do that. It's only when I surrender to the Lord and He lives inside of me that I have the strength to be the person that He's created me to be. When we accept Jesus, 
truly believe. Our wicked, hardened heart is displaced by this soft, pliable heart that craves righteousness, that starts to see people differently. See, this is what James is saying. He's saying, hey, folks, a true believer ought not to show favoritism or partiality to look at people and and categorize them and, and make themselves a judge over everybody. You know, we can't judge the world the way it is right now. That's God's job. What does God call us to do? (laughs) He calls us to exemplify a life that has been changed and to love other people as Jesus Christ loved us, even when they, they, they drove thorns into His scalp and they whipped Him beyond recognition. He hung on the cross, bleeding and dying, Not because he had to, but because he loved us. And he saw everyone in history that would be saved because of what he was doing. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, people that are in darkness, sometimes we try to hold them to a Christian standard. And you can't do that because there's no light in their spirit. They're dead in their spirit to God because of sin. So God calls us to show love even when people mistreat us, even when people don't meet our standards. So when we're walking down the street and we see that old bum in the alley and he's hunched over and he's dirty and he's smelly, he doesn't want us to steer around that person. The love of God says that we, 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 we look at people in their distress And we come to them with the love that He gives. And we say, how can I help you today? We load that person onto our ride and we take them to a place where they get care and where they can get cared for. We can't control exactly how they respond to that. We don't. But because we are the Lord's, we are called to be open to people and not to show partiality. And sadly... This makes it its way into the church. You know, I was going to, um, I was trying to figure out a way to do this, and I couldn't quite pull it together because of all the, um, the funeral preparations and everything that was going on this week. But actually, what I was going to do, I'll, I'll spill the beans here, okay? I was going to get Jeremy to cover for me, and, and Morgan and Courtney, and or sorry, Morgan and Corrine, and and Jeremy and Danny to do worship and, and uh, sort of sneak out. And I, I was going to get someone to dress me up in a disguise. There's a very good makeup artist here. I was going to come to church and sit in the corner right about there or right about the back over there or here, dressed up. Dressed up like someone who is just down on his luck. I shouldn't say luck. Who is de- in despair someone that was coming here to look for hope. And then, after that, I was going to get up after the worship set and come up here and preach this message. Why? Because it's so important that we see people as God sees them. That we love people just as God in Christ loved and forgave us. There's not a person that's here that's, that's deserving of that love. I'm not saying that we embrace evil behavior for the sake of love. It's not about that. You know, David Wilkerson, when he was uh, in New York City, you know, a number of decades ago, God called him to New York City and he lived in his car. Why did he live in his car? So that he could reach out to the gangs that were there. And the story goes on on how God miraculously saved these people because David was obedient and he showed no partiality. God's desire 
is that his followers become countercultural and world changing influencers. Did you hear that? God's desire is that his people become countercultural and world changing influencers. That we shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life to a crooked and depraved generation. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to approve what God's will is, His good, perfect, and pleasing will. Good, pleasing, and perfect will. And James speaks here about what being imitators of the attitude of Jesus looks like in practical terms. Doesn't he? He's like, okay, it's good for us to say that we believe, but this is what belief actually looks like on the ground. You know, in the New Testament church, uh, people didn't have... At, at this time when James was written, they didn't have big church buildings and all that. They met in homes or in courtyards and private properties, most likely from, you know, a prop, they met at a property that was large that a richer person had and, and he would give. Now, God designed the church to be a community that uh, reaches out to everybody. And he wants us all to be on the same playing field. You're a kingdom, as Christians, as true believers, you're a kingdom of priests before him. You're looking at a normal dude that's been saved by grace. Yeah, I have a different gift than you, and my gift is to preach the gospel. But I'm no different than you. We're all one in Christ. I'm just a beggar that's found a supply of bread telling other beggars where to find it. It's as simple as that. There is no elevation of position in Christ. We are all one. Galatians 3, 26-29 says this, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Hallelujah. What a promise. So, when we look at the person sitting next to us, or a person that comes in and they look like they've been beat up, How do we look at them? We look at them the same as everybody else with the love of Jesus in our eyes saying, you are precious. You are important to Jesus and you're important to me. That's the promise. God, when he changes us, he fills us with his spirit and he revolutionizes the way that we carry ourselves In our old sin nature way of thinking, it's normal for people to judge and draw conclusions about others by the way they appear on the outside. But this is to be no longer the case in the kingdom of God. Concerning this socioeconomic segregation, it needs to be banished from the local church. It needs to be banished. James continues saying, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are not they the ones that are dragging you into the courts? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him who, to whom you belong? So many people who are wealthy in this life, and I'd say in our culture across the board here, we're wealthy. So many people who are wealthy in this life struggle to have faith in God. Why? Because when they're comfortable, when they have everything they material need, materially need, 
And on top of that, they have luxuries and toys to occupy time. The tendency is to think, I have what I need in the life that I'm living, and I'm going to live the life that I'm living the way that I want to live. Why do I need God? God is a crutch. I do not need Him. How foolish. Any second our lives could be required of us. There is not a person here that could not be dead within the next 10 seconds. All it takes is one bodily malfunction to happen and you're seeing eternity and you're standing before God. Every one of us is in the same boat. Indeed, it's true that a rich and comfortable life can divert people away from trusting God. And that's why um, James is saying what he says. In Mark 10, 17 to 23, we're told of a scene unfolding before Jesus and his disciples. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. See, right there, he's challenging this man. So you're calling me good. Don't you realize that only God alone is good? Interesting point. Then he says, Do you know the commands? The commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared. All of these things I've kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. Isn't that an interesting comment? Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he wasn't going to lie. He wasn't going to lead him astray. He was going to tell him exactly what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. And then it was that man's decision what he did with it. Now Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he said, one thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's also of note that Jesus taught in Matthew 6, 24 that people cannot have two masters. They cannot serve both God and money. The poor are chosen in the sense that the poor more readily respond to God and faith having fewer obstacles in the kingdom. Church history exemplifies this amply. It demonstrates that comparatively more people that are poor in this world than rich have responded to the gospel. And this being said on a side note, I just want to mention this because you might say to yourself, well then, what hope is there for us because we're all rich? You see, we should remind ourselves also on a side note here that God never calls for us to show favor for the poor against the rich either. There's no partiality with Him. Okay? And neither should there be with us either. You see, my grandfather on my mom's side, he had a good job throughout his life. Real good job. He was a tough guy. My grandfather was tougher than nails. He was a Saskatchewan farmer, and he worked on crews, and he was tough. But he had this problem, you see. He drank too much. After a hard day's work, he'd take a case of beer, and he'd guzzle that down. And then my family would pay for it. In the end of his life, Grandpa flushed away everything that he worked so hard for materially, and him and my grandma were dirt poor when they died, when they, both of them died. They're dirt poor. Thankfully, thankfully, my grandfather on his deathbed, my mom said that she led him in the sinner's prayer before he died. But he lived a life that destroyed his life and everyone around him. And he was dirt poor, so because his poverty was brought about by some very foolish decisions, his position is not superior to the one who shows good stewardship over what God has given him to manage. You see, I also knew a man when I lived in Terrace who was independently wealthy. He had a business and he honorably carried out his business. And God blessed him 
abundantly. He treated people fairly. He was an elder in our church. Treated people fairly. And this man gave and gave and he 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 gave. And he gave. That was just his character. His name was George. George is with Jesus now. Half my library at one point belonged to him and he gave it to me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was a man of outstanding character. Not a perfect man, but he was outstanding in character. And he was wealthy. So what I'm saying is, he worked very hard and was disciplined. He went to work every morning. He carried his business with, with, with uh, the right morality. And he served Christ with what he had been given. See, see, it's not necessarily just the poor who are going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's not what it's saying here. It's saying that they're more apt to accept the message they're more apt to because there's less entanglements. But those who are rich in this life are commanded to be what? Rich in good deeds. So if you've got wealth, God's commanding you to use it wisely and to use it to help others. That's what he's calling us to do out of a heart of service to him. So, you see, God set us free from the ceremonial law of Moses. And it's not like if you're rich, you earn your way to heaven by giving a little bit here or a lot there. and You're not going to earn your way to heaven because, because you can't. Faith and grace is the only way that you can be saved. But let faith and grace do its work and let it transform your behavior because the Spirit of God calls out to you to walk as Jesus walked. To live as Jesus lived. Romans 13.8 says this. He says, Let no debt remain, remain outstanding except for the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. It's not possible for this guy here to love other people the way God desires. Man, I've been a... You guys know this. I've been a police officer for over 20 years. I'm a reserve officer now, but I've been a policeman for 20 years. I've seen all kinds of stuff. And my heart hasn't always been in the right place when I've seen the darkness around me. Nobody can skate through this life without facing these feelings. Only God can give us the strength to treat people the way that He desires us to treat them. We're so subject to bias, aren't we? We're so subject to being jaded. God wants to take your heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. That's what he wants. In Galatians 5, 13 and 14, Paul says, You are my brothers and sisters. You are called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire love is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love starts here between God and I. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then it moves outward. Love demonstrates itself in how I treat my fellow brothers and sisters, people in my immediate sphere of influence. But it also plays out in how I treat the other people that I don't know around me, the people that are beaten and broken and left for dead on the side of the road that need help. That love plays out in that too. James teaches the same thing as both Jesus and Paul concerning this principle when he wraps up his teaching suggesting that true believers ought to avoid favoritism and show respect for all people obeying the royal law of love. He writes from verse 8 to 13 saying, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he said, who, he who said, you shall not commit adultery also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So, in other words, 
James tells the believers in his letter, if they believe in Jesus, they ought to live their lives in loving service to him and others. As people who have been shown mercy by God and made born again by the Holy Spirit, we are to be changed in the way that we act towards others because of the way that God has changed us. We are to forgive others of their debts against us because God in Christ forgave us and forgave us such a large debt. debt. The freedom granted to us, though, means that we're no longer bound by the chains of sin, not just the consequences of sin, but sin itself. This means we don't have to sin anymore. I said this last week. I've said this a number of times. As believers in Jesus Christ, you've been set free from the shackles of sin. You don't have to sin anymore. Yes, we're going to because we're working this all out and God's helping us to to be sanctified as we go, but we don't have to sin. We're freed by the law of what? Of freedom that James is talking about here. We don't have to be guilty before God. We're free before Him. We live under a law of freedom. The law of love, the royal law, is a law of freedom. You're free to go out and love people with the love that Jesus gives you as much as you want to fill your boots with. There's no restrictions on loving others. You can do good to other people. Love does no harm to his neighbor. You can do good to people as much as God gives you the strength and the resources to do it. So let's do it. The world doesn't need to see the church with a bunch of stuffed up people that are always just thinking about themselves and could care less whether someone falls down and dies down the street while they're having church on Sunday morning. That's not what the world needs to see. The world needs to see Jesus Christ alive in His saints, living what they say they believe, and He's given us the provisions to do so. North American church, wake up. We don't have to live a a substandard Christian life. We can shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. This is a promise from God. It's in His word. And he's given us the provisions through his Holy Spirit to live out his word. Can't do it on our own, but God's given you the provisions. We can fully follow God faithfully. Do you believe this morning? I pray that you do. You know, some people believe, but they They don't have saving faith. Belief that is true and saving is demonstrated by a changed life. See, the demons believe, then they're wicked. They believe in Jesus more than a lot of people do. And they tremble. Why? Because they know what's coming, because they know what they've done and how their hearts are, and they know the punishment that's coming. Yet they don't submit to God. See, sometimes we can say we believe and we don't want to submit. God's saying, if you want to, you want to be my children, you need to believe and submit. Let your heart open. Let me take the sin in you and wash you clean. Let me fill you with my Holy Spirit so that you can be my ambassadors in this world. Children that shine like stars in the universe as they hold out the word of life. If you're here today and you need to get right with God, now is the time. If you're here today and you can't honestly say, Pastor Clint, my Christianity has, uh, has made a difference. I'm different than I was before I proclaimed faith in Christ. If you can't, if you, if you can honestly say that that's you, that you uh, you, you can say that I am a believer and that I've been changed, then you are one of the children of God. But if you can't say that my life has seen a difference, I prayed a prayer one time many years ago and that was it. That was it. Now, you know, I was baptized, whatever it is. If you have not submitted your heart to Christ, it's a facade. The faith that you say that you have is not real. It's not genuine. Changing Life-changing faith is the faith that God desires. 
and he will change you. If you open the door of your heart and you say, Jesus, I surrender, the Spirit of God will clean you out and he'll place his hope and peace and joy and love inside of you. And you will go out with power in the Spirit and your life will make a difference. So today, if you need that, I'm going to ask the people that have been called for communion to serve communion today to come to the front. If you need that, my friends, we're just going to turn this place into a place of prayer where we quietly bow our heads before God. If you need Jesus to clean you out and to save you, Today is the day of salvation. Ask him, to ask, ask him to clean you out and to be your Savior, and he will. If you truly believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And, and saint of God, yeah, all of us are in different places. Some of us are distant because we've been prodigal. We've gone away. And we need to return to the shepherd of our souls and ask him to renew our first love.